Sometimes when I have a coding problem or an abstract question, I reach for my little friend here and I explain the code line by line. By virtue of just explaining the code, sometimes I arrive at a solution, and that's exactly how rubber duck debugging got its name. You're probably wondering what on earth this has to do with how to Google effectively as a developer. Well, say you have an error, you can't usually just paste this into Google, and even if you strip it back to something usable, you might not find what you're looking for because questions, posts, and discussions, they happen in natural language. And so when you talk to one of these guys, you sort of convert your problem into natural language, which is more likely to match the titles and the contents of useful resources on the web. In this video, I want to show you some of the ways that even senior programmers use Google every single day to do their job. And as a new developer especially, learning how to wield Google to the best of your ability can genuinely make you a better developer overnight. It sounds a bit bombastic actually, but the truth is, knowing where to find the answers is just as important as knowing them, and you never really deserve much credit for sort of cramming everything in your brain like a sponge. Why should you memorize something you can so easily look up on Google? If you understand that as a junior maybe gearing for interviews, you are reluctant to rely on Google, we're gonna touch on that at the the very end, but first let me show you some practical tips that are going to help you find what you need. Search operators are a way to refine your search results by passing options to Google along with your search query. A really handy one is site colon. Say you're searching for an issue and you only want Stack Overflow answers, you can write site colon stackoverflow.com. This can be really efficient because from Spotlight or another tool, you can get straight to the website you want. It's also very handy because not all search fields are made equal. Google is the best search engine. It's what it's designed to do. When you go to a documentation website, for example, sometimes the search feature is lacking because it's not their focus. And so by using Google to specifically search, you know, for example, the React documentation, you can find results more efficiently. Another very practical handy operator I use all the time is the subtract operator, which basically filters the search results by removing any results that contain that keyword. A really quite common example is when you search for some JavaScript code and you're inundated with jQuery snippets. You could write minus jQuery to remove any search results that contain the word jQuery, presenting you only with the vanilla JavaScript options. I'm also quite fond of file type PDF because say you're looking for an ebook, this is one way you can hone in on the results. Now, there are a lot more search operators, but I don't actually care much to mention them because I think you'll use them far less than the few I just described. Fortunately though, I am linking to a sort of cheat sheets for Google search operators, so you can kind of learn them all at a glance and reference them if you need to. You can find a link for that in the description. What I want to show you next isn't an operator, so to speak, it's more of an option, and it's an option to only show you search results that appeared within a certain time frame. The thing about web development, as you know, is that things move quite quick, and sometimes the most relevant results will be the ones published in, say, the last year. So by going to tools and then changing search results to in the past year, you can filter results to get the most relevant stuff. Arguably, it's a good idea to apply this option to most of your search results, as you only want the most recent, up-to-date and relevant results. Doing this kind of thing via the interface is a bit tedious, but you can actually build it into Chrome, at least, search bar by going to settings, search engine, manage search engines, add, and pasting these values, which you can find in the description. Did you know you can literally do maths inside of a Google search results? You just type the equation and the result happens. It's a very handy utility. You can also do things like find your public IP address, do conversions between units. You can type fairly abstract things like what is the percentage of a number? And you can also set a 25 minute Pomodoro timer should you choose and want to be a more productive junior dev. I believe that with some search operators and some basic options, you can pretty much find anything you need to on the web. Say you have a question or maybe you lost a resource and you want to hone in and find it based on what you remember. That's where search operators can come in super handy as well. But frankly, one issue we really need to talk about as a junior dev is what to do when you experience an error and now you need to search that error. Because as a new developer, you'll often find yourself presented with something called a call stack, 
which sometimes has a human readable error message, but also a sort of history of what functions have been executed in what order. Sometimes even these functions don't even exist in your code. They exist in things like React or other modules you depend on. Overall, it can be a little bit overwhelming, especially since you can't just copy and paste this, this error into the search engine because you won't find a meaningful result. It's too long for one thing, and crucially, it's probably going to have some very specific references to your code. You know, line 60 in your index.js file is not the same as line 60 in somebody else's. My documents folder is, you know, slash bookers documents, right? If that file path existed in the error, it wouldn't really return any interesting search results. All this to say, when you're presented with an error like this, it's really up to you to kind of, you know, not panic, take a deep breath and sort of look for the key human readable parts of the error message. That will be your go-to. After that, it's a little bit about building clues on how to then construct a search query that's more refined. You might get lucky. Some frameworks, some libraries, they have quite common issues. And when you search for human readable error message, you'll find like a GitHub repo or a Slack Overflow post or a blog post that says, hey, you know, I ran into this issue. Here's how I solved it. You get the roadmap, but it's not always that easy, unfortunately. And that's part of being a dev, actually. Once you strip the error back and you've got something to go on, it's really then to make the search more specific again and add things like the language and the framework you're using. There might be a time and a place where you want to specify the version number because, you know, an error message relevant to one version of React might not be as prevalent in earlier versions, for example. That might take a little bit of trial and error. But again, as I mentioned with regards to the call stacks, the errors aren't always like propagating from your specific code file. It could be presenting itself in a roundabout sort of way. And this is when it makes sense to sort of question the layers of abstraction. You know, there's a really good post on Dev2 called How to Google Your Errors. I'm very fond of it because early on, there's a tweet by someone named Mark Erickson. He is a maintainer of Redux and has been on the Scrimba podcast. I've had the pleasure of speaking with him and very astutely writes that error messages usually have relevant info, that there's always some clue. You just need to be able to be calm and find it. This whole post is by someone named Sean Wang. He's also been on the Scrimba podcast. And the thing that he says best that I can't do justice myself is to think about your biggest unknown. I like Swix's point that the error could be coming from any number of places. You know, say you're brand new to a language, you might reasonably assume that the error could be to do with your misuse of the syntax or misconfiguration of a local tool. But if it's your bread and butter, if it's JavaScript or something and you've been learning it for a while, maybe then the issue is more to do with something, you know, beneath that, like the environment or the framework or the library. And I think here Swix is saying you don't have to think about it in a very specific order, but generally just knowing that there could be a few sources of the answer will help you arrive at that said answer sooner. There's a few more great tips in here, like read the docs, reproduce the error, and then finally ask for help. You're always welcome to come to the Scrimba Discord community and ask your questions in there where I and the rest of the team hang out. Anyway, if this all becomes a bit too much, you can always ask Google to do a barrel roll. Okay, so say you're a new developer and you're gearing up for your first developer interviews. I completely understand the concern that in an interview, you might not be allowed to Google. And as a result, building too much of a dependency on Google might hurt you. I have to be honest, this is a sucky concern. It's a shame because even the most experienced developers Google things on the job all the time. You know, if an interview is meant to be a measure of your ability to do the job successfully, then surely you should have the tools at your disposal. This is my opinion. I think a lot of companies are coming around to this school of thought, but equally, you can't always be sure what you're walking into when you go for an interview. So what do you do? Well, I actually don't know. Like I've not been in this position myself and I don't like to share advice based on opinion. For that reason, I'm very thankful to have had Mike from HTML, All The Things podcast on the YouTube channel with Leanne in past weeks. And so in just a second, I'll share with you their answer because I think it's a great one. That's all from me though. I just want to, well, we just want to remind you to please subscribe to the Scrimmer YouTube channel if you haven't already and like the video. Here's what Mike had to say. He's really the go-to guy for this. Again, be very vocal during the interview process about if you can't Google, about how you would Google because a lot of the times the interviewer themselves will be against the process of not allowing you to Google because they're just a cog in the machine. 
and they'll hear your their your method and be like, yeah, that's what I would do too, and kind of push you forward. For an interview that you know is going to be closed book, I would very much focus on those technologies. Now, yes, you might have to memorize some syntax. Yes, you might have to uh, learn some very complex structures and stuff like that. But again, this is a one-off. So focus on it like it is a test in school. Learn it like it's a test in school. Use it like it's a test in school. And then I don't want to, this is going to be a little bit controversial, but forget it like it's a test in school, like after. Because yeah. the reality <laughs> is you can't keep all that stuff in your head without, you know, hindering yourself about the next thing that you want to do.